let's start, let's, but let's start, I mean, you all know me to varying degrees. So let's start first of all, to see if anybody of you has uh, questions that you'd like to know more about me or know about something like that. Anyone? <laughs> Norm, I actually don't know you very well. I know I've talked to you a couple of times, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background. Okay, we can do that. I think that will be fun. Um, <clears throat> so let me just, I'll start from college forward. I think that's just the easiest place to start. Well, I grew up in Utah. I've lived in Utah my whole life, except for when I was away for, you know, school and mission, stuff like that. Um, but I went to BYU as an undergrad, and then I went to Princeton as a, for my graduate work. Um, ended up getting a PhD in economics from Princeton. And then I came back to teach at BYU. I taught at BYU for eight years in the economics department. Um, and then I left to work in state government. So that was in 2003. And I was in state government until three years ago. Did a lot of really fun things, including um, the biggest chunk of that time, I was assigned to be a policy advisor for the governor's office and specifically working with healthcare policy. And that was about, about eight-ish years worth of my time with the state government. Um, and then I left three years ago to become the executive director of the National Association for Health Data Organizations, which is a nonprofit. Um, but I have the sort of the experience of running a small business with someone else's money. So it's kind of, kind of a nice uh, learning experience for me to be able to learn how to run a small business and have to do all of the things. You know, there are just two of us that work here. Um, so I had to do all, learn how to do all of that. Uh, it's been a great experience to learn how to do payroll and do compliance and hiring people and all of the government regulations and everything that comes on small businesses. Uh, and then also have the challenge of making sure that we're bringing in enough revenue to, to meet our goals. As a, as a nonprofit, it's a little different. I mean, we just, we have to break even or do a little better than breaking even so that we don't have to dip into our reserves. So that's kind of my professional life. Um, I've been in the legislature since, um, so this is, I'm just concluding my eighth year. So December 31st will be my, the end of my eighth year. Um, and so that's how that's gone sort of politically. Um, other than the legislature, I was not really intending to be active as a Republican party person, but we got the memo that said we would like all neighbors to attend their, their caucus meeting. And I showed up to our caucus meeting and there were about six of us there and they said, well, we have to elect delegates to go to these different things. And nobody really wanted to take a Saturday and go do anything. And I said, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and so I did and slowly kind of found that there are lots of opportunities to serve in the Republican Party and have done many of those things as well. Some I like more and some I like less. But uh, I think my, my one comment on that is that, and, and I know that you all have been involved in things like this as well that when I go to some of these meetings, conventions or whatever, I see what I view as just people who are so different from me and who are so different from my neighbors that I try to represent what I consider to be the normal point of view. So <laughs> that's not casting aspersions on anybody else. This is recognizing that it is a big organization, a lot of viewpoints and trying to be a little bit more um, normal, if you will. I guess that's the best word I can come up with and, and not, um, putting anybody else down, but just trying to be what I consider to be the, the best that I can do to represent my neighbors. So, um, and then personal life, I, I think some of you have met my wife, Maria. I know Cindy and Cynthia have. Um, she teaches, well, she doesn't teach. She's the school secretary here at Provo Peaks Elementary. And we've been married for 33 years. We have three kids and three grandkids. So that's, that's I don't know, Courtney, does that help? Yeah, that was great, thank you. Do you have any follow-ups? I'm happy to take follow-ups on something like, on any of the questions. I don't have any. All right. Uh, does anyone else, Cindy, Cynthia, do you have any questions before I start to talk about things I wanna talk about? I'd rather talk about what you guys wanna talk about. I think once you get started, we will have questions. <laughs> All right. All right, let's, well, let's do this. So I, I want to talk about a couple of things that I am hoping to work on this year. Um, one of those 
is um, in the category of doing a better job at poverty, understanding and addressing poverty. Um, and so for the last uh, several years, I've been on the Social Services Appropriations Subcommittee. And, and as you can imagine, we get inundated with requests for um, the state government taxpayers to fund all sorts of programs that are well intended, <clears throat> seem like you know th that seem like that they're good ideas, but then the question is, well, we have a limited amount of money. Where should we be targeting that money? And after being on that committee for about two years, I started asking the question, what are we doing to actually help people get out of poverty? Because I see that we're doing a lot of stuff to help people in poverty but I don't see that we're doing very much to help people get out of poverty. And I talked to the advocates about this. I said, how many people do you know who want to be poor, who want to stay in poverty? And they said, like, very few. Like, that's, that would be, like, rare to find somebody who says, you know, I just, I really like being in poverty. And I, I, if I had a chance to earn twice as much money, I'd pass because I would rather do this. And so I'm like, okay, well, what are we doing to help those people? Because the metrics show that we're not getting that job done. We're not getting people who are in poverty out of poverty through our you know, intentional programs. Uh, some people do, I mean, many people do get out of poverty, but it's not really because of anything that our programs do to help them. It's often because of steps they've taken on their own. So we've been working for the last year, looking at, there's one program, it's about a hundred million dollars a year, it's called the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. Um, and that program is a federal program. It's mostly federal funding, but there's some state funding there that is intended to be temporary. That's the T and temporary assistance um, to, to help families temporarily while they get their feet under themselves and then they get up and they get out of poverty. Um, and that's the one you, you, when you hear people hear, you hear about work requirements. So this one has a federal work requirement. That's, that's the program that has that is built in. Um, but I look at the rest of the program, it's like, what, what in this program is providing resources to make people more productive and more capable of getting a, a, a decent paying job to build up? And, and I just don't see it. I just don't see that that program is there. So we've been working on a lot of um, ideas and um, restructuring that we could do to that program to see if we can make that better. So that's something that I look forward to continue to work on this year. Uh, we've made some progress. Uh, Weber County has a program that was their version of the program. I shouldn't say a program. It's, it's an approach, really. It's not even a program. Their approach is that they um, have a, instead of a program-centered approach where they say, well, we'll give money to these programs and hope that they can do it. It's exactly the opposite. It's a person-centered program. So they meet with the person and they, and they say, well, what is it that you need to be successful. I meet, they meet with a, an advisor from day one and they may need a certain type of health care or mental health care, or they may need housing, or they may need um, daycare, or they may need food. I think who knows what it could possibly be. And then they help them to access those resources that meet those needs that are almost, you can imagine in our community, there is almost everything can be resolved if you know how to go seek those resources. And so that's what they, that's what they, they help those families to do. So um, it's, it's an interesting concept. I, I, I really like the idea. I hope that we can make some progress. We've got about $30 million that we can invest in infrastructure to build up the ability to meet people in their communities and provide then that um, social networking and um, social skills to be able to find the resources that they need to get out of poverty and to move up. So that's that's one thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, any questions about that before we get too far beyond this? Oh, okay, well, if, if I, silence is a pass, right? So we'll, we'll move forward. Uh, another one that I just, just this month. So I'm on part of a working group um, that have been assigned to find ways of making life more affordable. And I don't even know what that really means. I think we just needed a, a title so that we knew 
we could call ourselves something. Um, and that comes in two different flavors, I think, for, for our purposes. One is um, addressing tax issues. So what are we going to do about tax stuff? And then the other side of that is more um, like housing, you know, affordable housing and how to, you know, what, what can we do to increase the supply of housing? So those are the, the two major thrusts. So I will talk uh, mostly about the tax side of this. One of the efforts that we have started but didn't finish is to exempt social security payments from the state income tax. And I will just tell you, when I first heard that idea about three years ago, I was like, well, why? Well, I don't like that. I was like very uncomfortable with it um, because I figured like, hey, if, if people are making money, we should broaden the base and lower the rate. And I started changing my mind when I learned that social security, when you pay in, you're already paying tax on it. So those things, you, it's we're double taxing it. You're, you're paying on the way in and you're paying on the way out. And so we're, we're trying to figure out how to do that. We, we, we got partway down the road, um, but the way that we did it was that for low income retirees who are getting social security, they can exempt all of their social security income. And then there's a range where they can only exempt part of it in their income. And then there's a range where they get nothing, like, like literally nothing. They pay tax on all of their social security income. And I'm like, I don't like that. So I would think that if the principle is we're going to avoid double taxation, uh, if we don't have enough money to exempt the whole thing, which we really should get there as fast as we can, but in the short run, everybody should get something. So we should say something like the first 20,000 is tax exempt for everybody. And then that gives us a nice um, slide that we can say, well, if it's the first 20,000 this year, then we can go to 25, then we can go to 30. And it caps out at around 40. So we don't have that far to go to get to, to 40. And we can say, well, once, once we get to 40, then it's pretty much 100% exempt. So um, working on that one to try to figure out how we could do it. It's, uh, I, think, I think we can get, uh, if there's political will, we have the money to be able to do most of it this year, if not all of it this year. So I am working on that as well. I've got a meeting with the tax commission next week to figure out um, how this complicates the tax calculations. So we need to figure out a way of doing this so that it's simple, so that the, the forms make sense and everybody can just claim it easily. So that's, that's, that's my other assignment is to work on this uh, affordability by reducing um, taxes. I'm focusing on social security. We would also like to reduce the overall rate because that helps everybody. Uh, so we're, we were at five, we went, we're now down to 4.85. I think we can go down to 4.75, maybe even further. It'd be nice to get down to four and a half someday. Um, but that's, make, that's what I've been working on with keeping, making life more affordable. Um, any questions about that? Those are kind of my, my two big things this year. I, I can talk about a bunch of little things, but those are the two big ones that are on my plate right now for this, at least for the time being. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, so you say the first twenty thousand would be tax exempt. Is that twenty thousand from Social Security? Yeah. Okay. So what? So what you would do is you take your total income from the federal return. So, so let's just say that it's seventy five thousand, and then you would subtract off up to twenty thousand dollars of Social Security income, and then that would be your new. That would be your state income. So. Okay. So this is for on working people, not people that have already started taking social security? No, it'd be for people who are taking social security, people who are receiving the social security check. Some of them are still working. Okay. Some of them have income from other sources. They have uh, private retirement. They have invested in 401ks. They own a business. They have, they have a lot of places out there. there. There are surprisingly few people whose only income is their social security check. Um, and that, by the way, that would be a pretty rough go of it for most people. If your only income is your social security check, that would be uh, pretty dire straits and they should definitely not be paying income tax because they're gonna need every penny just to, just to stay in it. So, yeah. Do you have another question? Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Cynthia, I can. Okay, I can. thanks. Um, so the state of Arizona doesn't, tax social security because they don't want to do double taxation. 
Mm -hmm. And so they just don't do it. <laughs> okay. So uh, you are talking about, you know, backing out of it gradually, which I appreciate. But um, as far as how to do it, the question is, how did we get into it in the first place? You can't undo something unless you know you, how you got into it in the first place. You have to untie the knot, so to speak, which yeah. it sounds like you're working on. But can you look to other states and see how they managed to cope without getting into ta double taxing people? Yeah, so we, we've looked at that. I mean, there are some states who don't have income tax at all. Um, and that, that is its own set of interesting, right? Just don't tax anybody's income and then this is, this is fine. Um, and then the states that have been able to move it back, they have just made it a priority. It's, it's, just, it's just that simple. They have just said, we're not gonna do this anymore. And so when you have a good budget year like we're having this year, now's the time to do it. Uh, we will have, we've had a good budget years the last two years in a row. And we can say, well, instead of um, spending that money on new programs, we're going to give it back. And I will tell you, this is always what gets us hung up up there. When you say we're going to give the money back to the taxpayers in the form of a tax cut, which is this is a form of a tax cut, then all of a sudden people start coming up with, well, who should we give it to? Well, I want to give it to this group. I want to give it to that group. I want to give that group. And I like the idea of Social Security because we will all eventually be social security, like the vast majority will be social security recipients eventually. So it will eventually give it back to everyone. Uh, so it, it does sell that place. But I, I do hear people say, well, no, um, I'm in a really tough district and, and you know, I need to do something for the poor people. I need to do something for the poor people. And I'm like, well. Um, well I, still, I still am putting that question in different terms. So you're talking about states that walk it back. Are you saying that all 50 states decided to tax, to double tax? All 50 states decided to tax Social Security? No, there, there are some states that have never had an income tax ever. And so those okay. decided not to tax any income. Um, and no, but I mean, any income is different than Social Security income. Yeah. At one point, did they decide to start? Okay, like Social Security was supposed to be our money put away in a nest egg, not yeah. money to decide what to give to other people who are poor, okay? <laughs> yeah. And yep. so why was it taxed in the first place? And are there some states that do have income tax, but they don't tax social security because it's illegal. Double taxation is illegal. Why don't they just stop doing something that's illegal? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. I have not gone back to look and see when did Utah start doing this. I had understood that we have always done this, that from the beginning of Social Security, the decision was made, we're going to tax it. Um, but I don't know. That's, I will just tell you, that's one of the things I do not know. And so we will, I, can, I can research that and find out. When did it get started? And the same thing for other states. Did they, did they just all do that when Social Security kicked in? Or did some of them make a decision later on to start taxing Social Security? So, yeah, I think that's a good that's a good question. Okay, Ben, your your hand is up. We haven't been raising hands; we've just been jumping in. So feel free. Okay, I'm just used to raising the hand. So um, regarding that Social Security question, um, most states do not tax Social Security. About four or five years ago, there was about 12 or 13 states that still did. And those are becoming fewer and fewer. Utah's one of the last states that still taxes Social Security benefits. And Norm, you and I have had this discussion and you know how I feel about this. So, um, but, and I think that's something legislature seriously needs to look at. I, again, I had the same questions a couple of years ago with you about you know, when did Utah start doing this and who thought it was a good idea? Yeah. yeah. And so um, maybe that's some history we need to dig up and find out when that started. But I think the net legislature needs to take a firm stand on this. And I know it's money that they've gotten used to having to use for other things by double tax, right? With a double tax. Yep. Uh, and so if they're going to give that you know, stop doing that, they're going to have to find money somewhere else to replace what's not coming in. 
Well, our, the reality is, is that we are in unprecedented econ economic growth. The, the average income has been rising very rapidly. And so you get a, a free tax increase when that happens, right? And so you, as people get more prosperous, then you're multiplying, you know, the 5% by this bigger base. So we don't need to keep all of that money. And I, so that's what I think this year is the perfect year to just go back. So I just did a quick check with Google. This is not official. Google says there are 12 states that still tax to social security, but 11 of those states provide some sort of offset for at least part of that income for some people. But you're right. I mean, that's not, that's not the right answer. The right answer is just to get rid of it. So that's yeah. hopefully, hopefully this will be the year that we can get rid of it. Uh, preliminary estimates is that it's roughly $130 million a year ongoing. That sounds like a huge amount of money, but I will tell you, I have seen more than that wasted on stupid stuff. So it's not impossible. We can, we, we can do this if we can just get the political will to do it. Okay, great. Um, oh yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I have another question, Norm. Yeah. I don't know how to raise my hand like <laughs> Ben did. just did, so <laughs> I have to do it <laughs> manually. You might say. Um, you know, we you talk about affordable housing, and I hear this all the time. Um, but I see so many apartments and condos going in throughout Provo. Is that part of the effort to provide affordable housing? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, but so here's the here's the economics of this, right? So the supply and demand of housing, um, you have a certain number of households, and you need that roughly about that many houses, right? And so the problem is right now, we have more households than we have houses along the Wasatch Front. So kind of begs the question about, you know, if not every household has a has a place to live, what are they doing? There are a few who are living in their cars or under bridges or things like that, or staying in motels or whatever. Though that number is really quite small. What they're doing is they're doubling up. They're moving back in with their parents, or they're moving in with, you know, like multiple families together, or sharing a place with more than one family. So the solution to the affordable housing issue is quite simple. It's more houses. Um, so that when, when you get to an equilibrium where you have the same number of houses as you have households that want houses, when that's kind of a market clearing balance, then the value is not determined by overbidding, which is right now we're getting this world of, of overbidding. The values are bid up because of scarcity. But when they don't become scarce, then, you, then they can be priced normally based on size that the bigger houses or in the nicer neighborhoods or whatever costs more in those smaller homes and the less nice neighborhoods cost less and things will work out. So cities have been aware that they need to get on the stick and provide more housing. Uh, in Provo, that has, Provo has decided that the best thing for Provo to do is high density, small unit housing. So if you go down to um, downtown area, so the corner of Third South and University Avenue, there's a massive apartment complex there, 200 City View four-story apartment complex with some building, some commercial underneath. The Bill Harris Music Store, I just saw drawings for that one. They're gonna take that all down. That basically it's the whole block and they're gonna put in the same thing, four, four stories over one. Um, and then down by the railroad tracks, by the Front Runner Station, you're, you can see those as well, they're still being built. So Provo has said, well, um, the easiest way for us as a city to support a rapid number of housing is to do this because the developers will do it. We can put a lot of housing on a fairly small footprint. And in the downtown area, we have the infrastructure to be able to support it. We hope, I'm like, I'm not speaking for the city, but I hope that they really thought through that uh, because I don't, I don't have to pay attention to that. Um, it, what we're missing, and this is what every housing advocate, every builder will tell you, what cities are not prioritizing is what I call um, starter homes. I mean, that, that means some different something to everybody else, but it is a, a smaller-ish house, maybe 2,000 square feet or smaller, on a lot, which is also smaller-ish, probably a fifth of an acre or smaller like that, but still it's a house with a yard, a place for kids and dogs, 
and chickens maybe um, to be like that. That's what's missing. You cannot find those homes, which makes it really hard for young families to get into home ownership because those high density ones are mostly apartments. Those are rentals. And so while they can find a place to live, they can't find a place to buy. Um, and then you, you live in there for a while and then you think, gee, I'd really like to buy a house, but the only houses that are available are $500,000, $600,000. And so you can't make that jump. Um, and so, I don't know, Courtney, you may be most, I'm looking at the, the video screen, you may be the most likely person here to have thought about that. Do you, do you have any thoughts about starter homes and uh, what that's like? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been um, looking occasionally. I, I looked a little bit more um, uh, consistently near the beginning of the year, but um, and I know things have changed, but even just to get 2,000 square foot home was five, six hundred thousand dollars, you know, plus even. And so there there definitely was that gap of being able to, find something that was affordable that wasn't complete trash. Mm. So we, we have a, a special guest visitor. I'm just going to pull up a chair here. Hang on a second. Come on, Ben, come on in. We will make room for you right there. Okay, sounds like a plan. There we go. So, so following up on what Courtney was just saying, that chunk of that segment of the market is a disaster. The supply of homes in that sort of size and price, well, the, the price that you could afford just don't exist. Uh, you know, two bedroom, one bath or three bedroom, two bath on a fifth of an acre, those are almost impossible to find. And when you do find them, they're selling for half a million dollars. So we have been pushing the cities to prioritize that segment of housing. The developers, can do that profitably. They can they can build those houses and sell them no problem because there's plenty of people who want one, but they're just so scarce that the, that the prices have just gone through the roof. And so that's another area that that I think really is critical for um, affordable housing. So Ben, did you, ben, the other Ben, Ben, there's, we have two Bens. Yeah, Ben, there's our Ben Summerhalder. Summerhalder, and then we've got Cindy and Cynthia and Courtney. So it's nice that we're piling up names. Courtney, <laughs> I don't know how you got the right account to get on. I tried it and I couldn't get on. So he <laughs> walked over here. All right. So Ben Summerhalder, you had a question? Um, well, I was going to, this doesn't mean I agree or disagree with what Provo City is doing with the density housing. Um, but I do know that the city is in their agreements with developers that um, it doesn't solve the problem of starter homes like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But they are providing in their agreements a certain percentage, and it depends upon the development, but a certain percentage has to be affordable housing yeah. for low income that way. And so they are trying to deal with some of it that way by telling developers, you either agree to this or you don't get to develop. And so um, uh, they are providing some affordable housing that way, but it doesn't deal with the starter homes that way. Uh, and I don't know what the answer is for that. Well, and I shouldn't just be all provocentric, but Springville has the same exact same issues. So if you go out in the West Fields, kind of west of where Cynthia lives, um, those they're turning those into lots, but they're not smaller homes. They're actually pretty decent sized houses down there. They're probably 3,000 square foot plus houses on quarter acre lots, which is fine because that, that helps with the problem. And then you go south of fourth south, and it's the same thing like we're having down down here. It's these um, uh, block style buildings that are you know 12, 12 units per building with six buildings per development. So they're fitting 72 units on a fairly small footprint, but we're missing that middle. We're still missing that middle ground. And so we're we're trying to yeah. encourage the cities to prioritize uh, being not missing that diverse that segment of their diverse housing. Mapleton, which, which I don't represent, but Mapleton pretty much right now will not authorize anything smaller than about a half acre. Half acre, yeah, still. Um, but there are other factors besides what would be ideal as far as a pluralism of options. 
for housing, and that is that there are certain agendas which Provo City may or may not be subject to. I know that there are some people who are very much into the environmental point of view that nobody should be owning <laughs> their own house and land and that everybody should be in uh, modules of high density housing. And so those are undercurrents or in some cases they're the overcurrent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, they use environmental and energy saving and all this other as a reason why ordinary families can't own property and own a home. And then also there's a millennial point of view. This is more, not so much the traditional environmental um, point of view, but there's the millennial point of view, which is a minimalist idea. Um, high tech people don't want to have a lot of things. They don't want to have a yard. They're not going to have kids. They have dogs and they tend to want to have maybe a high, a high prestige posh apartment setting. Um, and um, they think if they go along with the environmental, they think the world's overpopulated anyway. And <laughs> I mean, so there are some agendas and ideologies that are pushing the market, pushing developers and pushing politicians um, in a certain direction. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, we have to keep in mind, not to complicate matters, but we have to keep in mind that there are spoken and unspoken agendas driving this push towards high density for all. Well, and that's kind of like a Russia or China or Hong Kong or, or Tokyo scenario where nobody has a lot of space. And, and home ownership is not for everyone, but it is for the vast majority of Americans. They have more wealth, who, if they're homeowners, they have more wealth in their home that they can use for retirement or for emergencies or whatever. Right. Than any other source, right? It's, right. So this, this philosophy you're talking about is also, well, let's, we don't, if, if we can prevent people from home ownership, we can also prevent them from wealth accumulation and so that they're more yes. dependent for, for a lot more things. So yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is a thing. Um, I, just, I just really wish we could figure out how to, how to, there's, because there's, for me, there's the dual role. One is, is to get this under control by resolving the supply and demand problem. And then the other one is to create features of that market that encourage and facilitate people like Courtney to be a homeowner. Yeah. The sooner the better. <laughs> the sooner the better. Now, um, I have a question about rent. Yeah. And please tell me if this is relevant to Utah. I'm going to use an example of my niece in Phoenix. She got a letter from her landlord in January that raised her rent from um, $1,035 to about 13 something. Mm -hmm. And then in July, the fiscal year, she got another letter raising her rent another 200. And it offsets, she just got a great job with the uh, Arizona Supreme Court and she got a pay raise because she's a hard worker, but already the pay raise is eaten, more than eaten up. Plus with the um, high gas and high food processes, even though she has a spectacular new job, they're still going under the poverty line, which goes back to your first thing. And, um, running into you know danger of indebtedness. And I wanna know, does Utah have a cap on how much landlords can raise the rent per year? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think any, uh, nowhere in the West that I am aware of does. With the exception of, um, there are some renter rights during your, the first year of your rental agreement. So during the first year, um, not only is it typically written into the contract that this is going to be the rent for, for the first 12 months, there's also some protections in law which pre prevent the landlords from just backing out and trying to renegotiate midway through that first year. But for the most part, once you hit that one year mark, it is uh, an ongoing um, relation of, relationship of convenience that the renter can leave with you know, 30 days notice or sometimes 60 days notice and the landlord can either raise your rent or the landlord can ask you to leave with, with notice. It's Okay, it's so what about leasing where you have a longer term? Because that we can get all this high density housing, 
to yep. try to help people with lower incomes, et cetera. But if the landlord can raise the rent constantly with, without impunity, doesn't that sound cool when you say without impunity? Uh, okay. When they can do that um, all the time, then our, like my niece, who's been re renting or leasing a home is thinking about moving into a travel trailer. Yeah. And that, that's, that is, I, I don't know, I, I'm not an expert in housing law, but my understanding is that, that once you've gone through that first 12 month period of any residential agreement, whether it's a lease or rent or whatever, that pretty much um, it's subject to landlords raising the, the price or even asking you to leave. And so it's, it's, it's tough. And on top of that, uh, something else that I don't know that most people are aware, um, it used to be that these sort of, what are the venture capitalists, hedge funds, whatever, venture capitalists, when they were looking for things to buy, they would buy businesses. They were, it was always commercial. They may buy commercial real estate, but it was always business oriented. A couple of years ago, some of them started figuring out that residential is where it's at. And so they will go into neighborhoods and pay cash for homes uh, with the intent of adding them to their rental portfolio. And across the country, you're starting to see these companies, which are mega landlords. They own yeah. hundreds of thousands of properties across the country, and they run it like a hardcore business. They don't, this isn't, you know, um, the nice guy in the neighborhood who built a fourplex and has always been around. Like this is, this is somebody who's managed in some corporate office somewhere and they look they do all sorts of analytics and metrics to try to figure out what rent they should charge and all of that sort of stuff and they run it like a fairly lean business raising rents if they need to and uh, asking people to leave if they need to and it's it's become uh, the rental universe has become very corporatized to what it was five years ago there's a very good chance that if people are looking at a single family home they may find that they're renting from a corporate entity that's a little different than the apartment complexes which Provo is that's a thing student housing and all but if you're just going into a neighborhood and saying I want to live in you know our neighborhood here or in Cindy's neighborhood and there's a house that's for rent there's a reasonable chance that it's um, owned and operated by a corporate uh, operation out of who knows where so Ben Summerhalder just tell me when yeah you're um I was recently elected president of our HOA and we're dealing with rentals that way in our complex. We're in Franklin Park. We take up two city blocks with 96 units with eight buildings. And um, right now we're at about 35% rentals out of our 96 units, which is like 33 point something. And um, to me, that's too high. There are too many rental units. We may be discussing uh, and HOA, COAs with their CCNRs and their bylaws, they can amend those and change that. But we cannot exceed 35% in our rentals or we lose FHA status. And so people could not come in and want to purchase one of our condos that's available um, and get F FHA funding for that if we exceed 35 wow. percent so that's and we've been in our condo for 20 years now and we own it and we're probably gonna the only way we're leaving is when they take us to the morgue so <laughs> um but uh that's something we're looking at is that that we just think the rental is too high that way because it tends to be we have other problems at our complex that um and most of them are caused by renters because they're not vested in the community. And so that's one of the reasons, you know, big reason we're looking at um, amending those, those bylaws so that we have fewer rentals. Yeah. Um, we're even looking at maybe lowering it to 25%. And of course, those that are already rentals, we'd have to grandfather into that. But, um, but if they sell, you know, they can no longer sell it to, if it exceeds the 25% or whatever we think we need to be at, um, then they would not be able to sell to an investor. They would yeah. have to sell it to somebody purchasing it as their, their home. 
yeah, and right. environmental. So, um, and I think that's something that that's widespread. It's not just isolated with our our association or a couple others. I think that's widespread, and so that's one of the things that that with this high density housing that Provo City is engaging with the developers. Um, if you notice where it's going up, it's going up where there's mass transit. Um, the mill, I think it's the mill race project. That's what they're calling it. That's the one down by the modal hub um, in East Bay uh, with front runner and the buses and all of that. Um, and they're developing those areas with, with that high density close to mass transit um, that way, because as I think Cynthia mentioned earlier, that you've got millennials and others, and I can't keep track of all the different names for the generations, whether it's Z or X or whatever it might be, but, but she's right. A lot of them are, are, you know, they get married, but they're not gonna have kids. Their children are their pets. Um, they don't have a car, they use mass transit. And so the, a lot of the high density is going up where there's mass transit either existing or being developed. Um, and so if you look around Provo and see where those developments are going, I think you'll notice that. Um, but this is a, the rental problem is because it's changed so many neighborhoods because corporations have done that, they've come in. And that's where we had this last committee we had, um, the previous one. They, the three elected officers on the committee were all investors. They did not live on site. Wow. And consequently that created some problems that the new committee, which all of us are, are resident homeowners um, that we're having to deal with. And so, um, you know, it's, we'll make it, we'll get out of the hole they dug for us. And, um, and we'll get our association back on a sound financial foundation um, for future committees to move forward. But, but this is something a lot of associations are dealing with. And so, um, and it affects the, the, the nature of the neighborhoods. Yeah. When you have too many rentals and corporations coming in and buying those residences and turning them into investment properties, um, it changes the nature of the neighborhood. It changes the culture in the neighborhood. Um, and it, you get too much of that and it actually, and I'm gonna say it, it destroys the neighborhood. It does. No longer have family oriented neighborhoods in the sense that my brother still lives in the house that all of us kids grew up in. And I was born in 1952. So um, you don't see that anymore and I think that's that's created a lot of the problems we're having to deal with in our neighborhoods in Provo and in Springville. Well we've so we've got about 10 minutes left and I did want to cover one other topic. Um, Don Olson who's watching us through the Facebook version of this asked about Utah Lake. So I do want to make sure that we get to Utah Lake because I am looking around the room. I think some of you may care about Utah Lake as well. So Let's talk about that. Um, I had the opportunity to go down with um, Conserve, I think it's Conserve Utah Valley is the name. Um, they had gotten a volunteer to take us out on a sailboat and go out on Utah Lake and you know, just, just be out on the lake for about an hour and a half and experience that. And talk about with them about vision and goals. Um, and some of the things that I have learned about Utah Lake, uh, it's not as bad as it used to be. Now that's not saying it's good, but it's not as bad as it used to be. And the lesson that we learn from that is that things do work. There are things that do work. So I don't know if you all saw in the newspaper that uh, one of, there was a, some BYU researchers, I think they were graduate students, had collected aerial photograph data of the lake from the last, I don't know, 25, 30 years, and had looked at the algal blooms, where they were located, how big they were, how consistent, and they noticed that they've really gotten smaller. Those algal blooms were concentrated around where water came from communities into the lake. So whether that's where a, a river's coming in or whether you've got a, a treatment plant or whatever is coming in the lake. Um, and they, they, it is believed that our efforts at cleaning up the um, 
I guess effluent is probably the correct word, um, into the lake from above upstream, cleaning that up has really made a huge difference in making the lake more healthy. And Provo, I think you guys are aware of this, Provo and uh, I don't know if Springville is part of a, a, a consortium as well, but Provo City alone has invested, I believe it was $300 million in a new water treatment plant to clean, to tighten that up even further. So just make sure that what we're putting into the lake is as clean as it can possibly be. Now those, it's kind of hard because the more progress we make, then the EPA lowers the standards or raises the standards, however, whichever way that's supposed to go. So it looks like that we're less compliant than we used to be, but we're less compliant to a stricter standard. And so we're, we're making huge progress on Utah Lake. Um, there are other issues with Utah Lake that I think some of you are aware, the carp issue is a problem that apparently has no solution. I thought that maybe the carp issue could be a solution to world hunger. Uh, we could just teach people how to enjoy eating carp and then we would have a limitless supply of fish. We could just give that to everybody in the whole world. But there are hundreds of millions, I think is the term I understand it right, of carp in the lake. Um, the people that are down there are extracting the carp, harvesting them or whatever you want to call it, they're pulling out, they're pulling carp out by the millions and not making really much progress in eliminating the population. So you can pull out tens of millions of carp from that lake uh, and they will reproduce and replenish themselves until you can finally get ahead of them. That, so that's it. that is another problem that doesn't have a solution. Um, there's been another fish that's been introduced now that is creating another threat. It's the Northern Pike, um, which are actually very nice fish uh, in terms of fishing, but they kill everything. They are um, some of like, for, from, from a freshwater perspective, they're predators. Yeah, we're fierce predators. Fierce predators, they will kill everything. Now, my thought was, well, maybe they'll kill the carp, but with hundreds of millions of carp, I don't think, I don't think you could put enough pike in that lake to do that. But so that's another problem now because those are um, they're attacking and you know because we, we, we got the June sucker issue solved or at least so it's not critical it's like still a problem but it's not we, we have an approach for that one but now we've got the northern pike problem so it's just a never-ending thing people do all sorts of crazy stuff uh, so so here's the here's my take on Utah Lake we know some things that make it better that's one Two, we all want, I don't know anybody who doesn't want Utah Lake to be better, um, but we, we don't necessarily know how to make it accelerate, how to accelerate that progress. So we're making slow and steady progress. If people would like to see that go faster, we don't really know how to do that one. If somebody actually has an idea that is known scientifically to work, I think I would be interested in that one. So since that is the state of affairs, um, we created the Utah Lake Authority that includes a mix of science, scientific folks, and then local government folks. So mayors of the cities around the lake and other kind of elected officials to keep an eye and to guide the thinking on this project. I think that was a good move. I think it was a move in the right direction because now we've got some, some decision makers who are directly impacted by this, who can have, have input to that one. But um, the real problem, which is one that we don't have any idea how to solve, is the lack of water, right? That's the, you stack this up however you want. The Great Salt Lake water levels are falling. Great Salt Lake primarily gets its water from Utah Lake and the Bear River. Those are the main waters. Those are, those are also in trouble. So how do you fix the Great Salt Lake and preserve Utah Lake and get everything all together all at once. So Cynthia, yes. Okay. Um, first of all, you trust the cycles of nature. So for example, Lake Mead has gone down and they've found like four bodies already to unsolved murder crimes. So yeah. there may be a reason why these things are happening. The earth honors its inhabitants and, it, and the other creations and it goes through cycles. And so then according to my Swedish grandfather, the best fertilizer is fish. And we're facing a fertilizer shortage. So you get a way to scoop the dried up carp because the, the cycle of nature 
has brought the water level down enough and you get them into a processing uh, facility, hopefully one that doesn't make pollution, but that makes fertilizer. I mean, we have to think like pioneers. These problems that we're having, we sometimes treat problems as obstacles, but problems are really opportunities to find solutions. So um, my grandpa was really pleased when my brother found a big sturgeon out on Green Bay when we were walking one time. And my grandpa drove all the way out to where my brother found the sturgeon, picked it up and chopped it up for his raspberry patch. Because he said he knew from his life in Sweden, that's the best fertilizer. So um, I think a lot of creative thinking uh, and dealing with the realities as opportunities. I think there's a lot to be said from that one, which is that not every change is a disaster. They can be opportunities. I, I do worry about the Great Salt Lake, and I don't know how to turn that into not a disaster. But Utah Lake, boy, it's, it's a fabulous resource, um, and it is underutilized. That is one of the things that everybody agrees. It's underutilized for recreation. It's underutilized for fish, the, you know, the carp supply. There's a lot about it that is underutilized, and so we're... we're uh, we, have a, we have to view this as an opportunity to use that resource to make everything uh, get into a better state. So uh, we've got just two minutes left. So we, we, we will have more opportunities, by the way. And so maybe not, now is my chance just to kind of plug um, normthurston.com slash events. You can see the calendar of both in-person and online events coming up. We'll have plenty of a chance to talk more about all of these issues in person, um, or if you want to come again to another online one, love to do that one again. So we are um, thrilled to have that, that opportunity to meet with you again. Okay, yes. one more thing then to think about for next time. I went to the Provo City Cemetery to visit the Memorial to the Unborn Children and it had been removed because of a complaint, even though it was put up by the Catholic Church, um, Knights of Columbus, somebody complained. So the Provo City attorney and the Provo City Sexton, they told him that he could choose and he took out the memorial for the unborn children. So, um, and you know, that's kind of a trend now to take out any monument that somebody complains about. So I'd like you to think about that and, and see if we can, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. The, the, I mean, that, that it, I wish it was in Provo City Cemetery, but I do believe that they relocated it up to the Catholic Church up in Orem. So uh, it, it is still around, right? It is still around, but why can't we have that? It was right next to baby Jane Doe's, which yeah. the police put up and they didn't take that away. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, there is, there is that. Yeah. We don't have time to talk about that. So no, but I said for future reference, yeah, for future reference, I will definitely put some thought and we can talk about that. Uh, you know, protecting the unborn. Uh, I have I have a lot of thoughts. I've had I've you know been forced to think about this a lot more than I really want to over the years and try to figure out where I come down. We can we have a great conversation about that next time. So thank what, you. What I think about the unborn. So, all right. Well, thank you everyone for your time. Um, like I say, if you could just take a few minutes, go over to normthurston.com/events, uh, mark your calendars, and uh, hopefully you can join us again for events in the future. So, thank you. Thank all. you for your work. Oh, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody.